Mark Vernon, welcome again to the Church Times podcast. Thanks very much. Nice to talk to you again. Now, this year, as, as many are aware, is the 700th anniversary of, of Dante's death. And um, there's quite a few books being published, um, some of which are reviewed in this week's Church Times. Um, your book is called Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey. Um, what do you hope your book's contribution will be to marking the anniversary? It's partly to help people find a way into the Divine Comedy. Um, you know, it's famously a complex book, but it's one of those books that when you get an entree, it starts giving and then just continues giving. And so it's really worth making the effort. So my book's partly to help with that, but then also to open up in a particular way, which is to focus on the spiritual transformation of Dante, because he very explicitly says he's writing about this, not just for his own benefit or indeed for the people of his own time, but for us in the future, because he realizes that how we perceive the world is absolutely crucial to how we share in divine life and so he wants to open that up um, and so in this year when Dante has been celebrated I wanted to really make sure that there was as well at least one book out there that was majoring on that aspect as opposed to say the literary aspects the historical aspects all those other things which are in Dante as well. Well so your your book um I mean, it, it goes through the divine comedy different parts of it but it's, it's not a sort of um, literary analysis as such is it? No, it's partly a narrative retelling. So you can, you know, read the book um, on its own, but then uh, both unpacking some of what's going on, particularly in relation to Dante's interactions, transformation, um, but then the spiritual significance of that, both in terms of the church, um, the times, our times, Christianity actually as a whole. I think that it's remarkable that they're, although it's 700 years on, uh, 700 years old you know the divine comedy is still speaking to our times perhaps because in a way it comes at the beginning of our times you know Dante is one of the first people to use the word modern he recognizes that the medieval world um, is shifting and changing and so he wants to work out how with a new mentality of what it is to be human we can still remain firmly in touch and participating in divine reality do you think that the spiritual and theological significance of Dante has been lost at all in modern times? I mean, are literary scholars, do they tend to n neglect that somewhat? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. It's quite common, actually, in a lot of the academic study of um, spiritual literature, you know, which, which was, of course, much literature before the modern period, um, how it studied, and very interestingly, in all sorts of ways, for its contextuality for its devices for its innovativeness um what it says about the times and so on but you know a lot of big writers you know the particularly people like Dante and Shakespeare I think are writing for our spiritual benefit too and so to exclude the theological or bracket out the divine really it's it, actually I think it's quite violent on these texts actually um, and, um, you know, I want to resist that. You see it happening quite a lot. It, it, the, the, there was even an article about Dante, which made the remark that um, some scholars have suggested it might even have religious intent, um, as if that was sort of be, just not just being excluded, but actually forgotten, um, which is very remarkable when you think it's a journey through hell, purgatory and paradise. That is, that is remarkable. Can I ask you a bit about Dante's life circumstances when he started writing The Divine Comedy? I mean, you, you write about this in your book. Yeah, so he, um, famously the opening line is midway through the journey of our life. He, he does actually say our life, so he recognises that what he's undergoing individually is shared. And um, he is, um, he sets it in about 1300, although he completes it um, towards the end of his life in 1321. And he is at that stage already a famous poet. Um, he's quite a prominent politician too, but because of the civil war of the times in Florence, but then also amongst different Italian city-states as well, um, he falls foul of the winning side and so gets sent into exile. In fact, never returns to Florence again, you know, which he writes about quite a lot. It's, it's devastating because Italy wasn't a unified country, so it was very much like being expelled. And of course, for a poet, that included being expelled from your native speakers. Um, you know, Dante's remembered in Italy for forging modern Italian because at his time, there were lots of dialects 
Um, so this was, you know, truly a devastating experience. He loses his property for quite a long time. He's out of touch with his family. Um, but what's so remarkable is that it's in this period that he starts to work on the Divine Comedy and completes it. So it's not just a recovery from a midlife crisis, but is using that kind of crisis to dramatically expand his sense of what life's about. But by following the descent, you know, by not turning his back on the suffering, um, which I think is why he realises that he has to journey through hell before he can begin to climb up towards the stars. I'm quite interested in how the Divine Comedy can be read, because I suppose it can be read in numerous ways. I mean, how, how do you read it as a guide to the afterlife? I mean, it's, it's primarily a sort of inner journey that he's he's talking about, or, or is, he, is, it, is he intending any of that to be taken at all, literally? Well, he, he does actually explain how he feels that the Divine Comedy should be read in a letter to um, one of his patrons called Can Grande. And there he says that we need the literal to kind of get us going, um, you know, in a religion like Christianity where incarnation is central. Um, it's got to land somewhere firmly in our embodied life, in our times and history. Um, so I think that's why he uses the standards a medieval pattern of reality of, of hell, purgatory and paradise. But the literal is only the start of it. It's like the first step. And very quickly you realise that he's taking you into a place where as your familiarity and as you're challenged by where you're journeying um, works on you, you change and reality opens up to you more and more as well. So it becomes both a psychological or inner journey and a journey into objective reality. He's quite clear that the two do go together. Um, and so he sees more and more, not just of himself, but of the inside of the whole world. And so understands more of the way things truly are. And, and the, the standard way of explaining this in the medieval world was to say that from the literal, you move to the allegorical, which is where you start to see the meaning of things, not just the literalness of things. But that is challenging. It doesn't just, as a word, confirm you and affirm you. It leads to a third stage, which is a tropological, which comes from the Latin for turning, so the Greek for turning. Um, and then as you turn, gradually, part of the gift of being human is that you can gain sight of things from the anagogic level, which is the divine level, which is, of course, why he doesn't just go through hell and purgatory, but goes into paradise, where divine sight becomes more and more possible. Um, so, yeah, he's he's starting with Hell, hell 101, if you like, um, certainly for people in his times. But he immediately starts challenging that and says that if you think you've got it, then you really haven't. Virgil and Beatrice are his two principal guides. Is, is that right? What's the relationship like with them? How, how are they guiding him? Yeah, so the story is that, um, well, actually, um, Mary in heaven is looking down and realising that Dante has gone deeply astray in his midlife crisis. Um, and so she speaks to Lucy, St. Lucy, the, um, the saint of light. And of course, light is this hugely rich part of the divine comedy, bringing light to darkness and then traveling into greater and greater light. Um, and then Lucy speaks to Beatrice. Um, and the significance of Beatrice is that she was the, the youthful beloved of Dante. And so when he fell in love with her, the light of love was awoken in him. So she's where love and light come together practically and actually in his own life. So she's this kind of seminal figure for Dante. Um, but Beatrice herself sends Virgil first um, to take Dante through um, the Inferno and then up Mount Purgatory. And I think the reason for that is that, in a way, Dante, as a great poet, can speak to Virgil as a great poet on a kind of equal footing, um, and so rather than just being kind of overwhelmed by Beatrice's appearance, by the divine light, he must kind of work on himself first of all um, and uncover his shadows as much as develop his virtues. Um, and, you know, that, 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 that's, that sort of rings true, I think, in any kind of spiritual path that, you know, if you, you need to find a teacher that meets you where you're at and then you can be taken elsewhere. Whereas if you just have a kind of, peak experience or a dazzling vision of reality, um, a, a sort of overwhelming ecstatic experience. I mean, that may be much treasured by you because it makes you realise there's more to life, but it doesn't actually change you. It just sort of leaves you a bit dazzled. Um, so you need to find teachers, guides who can meet you where you're actually at 
so that it can become the divine vision can become part of your everyday life not just an exceptional experience i think that the, the first of all virgil and then beatrice is is thinking about things in that way do you see any parallels there with your work as a, as a psychotherapist where you journey with people and help them face reality but also find change and hope or is that a bit anachronistic to apply those terms to dante no, I mean, I, I, I have definitely found that. And in fact, the Divine Comedy, first of all, began to really make sense to me, um, not just actually because of my work as a psychotherapist, but because of my own psychotherapy. Um, and I realised that modern psychotherapy, well, at least this was my experience, is really good at taking you down um, into the depths of your fears and suffering and where you're stuck, where you're trapped. Um, and it certainly does that. Um, and it can begin to help you see life anew um, because you start to see around and through that which is um, imprisoning. Um, but, you know, modern psychotherapy, much like other parts of the modern world, is a bit ambivalent about spiritual reality. Um, and so it was reading the Divine Comedy in a small group where we were very clear it could speak to us um, that began to add an extra piece um, to my own psychotherapy complementing it extending it um and and you know since, since ever since as a psychotherapist i've tried to really hold that in mind and what does it mean not just to help someone understand what is imprisoning them but what does it really mean to find liberation um as well and can we work on that too in in our meeting you write um in the instructions book that the divine comedy is full of tragedy but is more completely understood as a comedy um, could you explain what you mean by that yeah, so comedy means that there's delight and joy at the end, not just a good laugh. And it's in this older sense, of course. And um, what is so tremendous about the Divine Comedy is that the question is not whether Dante will journey to paradise. He's told that right from the get-go, actually, but it's how. And I think this is a really important part of the Christian message that often gets lost actually that it's not will you be saved but how will you be saved that's what the invitation is to throw yourself into your life right from now knowing that it's only going one way ultimately but not knowing the path that you're going to take and also knowing that there's genuine suffering and difficulty on the way in part at least I think because it demands everything of you um, and so that is bound to be difficult, um, bound to be even feeling like it, you, you despair of yourself, because in a way you have to despair of yourself to realise there's so much more um, that is available to us. Yeah, so um, I think that that is very much, that's very integral um, to the Divine Comedy as well. And I watched an interesting video, you've posted many fascinating videos online about the, um, Dante and the Divine Comedy. There was one about, I think, some of the spiritual lessons or guidance for us today. Um, would you be able to give us an idea of, of a few of those? Yeah, so yeah. I try to give a kind of uh, top 10 spiritual insights right. for Dante um, as a bit of fun. But, you know, serious. Um, it's things like how in the fullness of time we start to see in life that what seemed like just a descent, a decline, um, something terrible, um, a tragedy, was actually also part of our ascent, was part of the comedy of life, leading us to delight. Um, you know, we, we, you know this in suffering when, so long as you're not completely overwhelmed by it, and of course sometimes people are, it's when you're suffering that you never most keenly know about the desirability of love, say, or connection or relationship. Um, so there's already, for us in everyday life, intimations of how descent and ascent are linked. Um, and this becomes clearer and clearer to Dante. Um, but then I think the, you know, the ultimate um, vision that Dante has, um, which again is in a lot of spiritual traditions, but I feel is a bit marginalised in a lot of Christianity now, is that um, our being and your being and my being um, is just as many reflections of the divine being. Um, this in Indian philosophy, this would be called non-dualism. Um, it's in Paul. And when Paul saying 1 Corinthians 15 makes remarks like God will be known as all in all, um, or he's taking on the mind of Christ. Um, there's a sense in which he is 
living more and more outside of himself. But that is at the same time mean he's becoming more and more himself too. Um, and Dante, I think, has that experience. He, when he's in the high reaches of paradise, um, close to seeing God unalloyed, he sees all the other souls and angels and other creatures around and about him more and more clearly in their individuality. And there's some extraordinary paradox there that the more they become themselves, the more they're actually outside of themselves and living um, the divine life. Um, so, again, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful vision um, of, uh, that's promised, um, but that, you know, dare, it's, you know, a lot of mystics have said this, figures like Meister Eichhardt, is often quote, quote often quoted now when he makes this remark, you know, my sight and um, God's sight and God's love and God's no knowledge and so on is one sight, love, knowledge and yearning. But he knows he's not God at the same time, you know, so that's sort of very much part of um, this journey too. It's interesting what you said earlier about you, you reading um, The Divine Common, I think, in, in a small group initially. I mean, is that something you think would be profitable for church groups to do, perhaps during Lent or other times of the year? Yeah, um, it really helps. Um, it keeps you at it. And it, it's broken down into 100 cantos. And so it's actually in quite manageable chunks. But it is 14,000 lines if you go through all three. And you really do. Don't just read the Inferno and think, you know, oh, good, I've done a bit of Dante. Because the Paradiso is, is really amazing, um, as much as both the Inferno and um, the Purgatorio are as well. But a small group can really help and, and get a translation that is accessible with a good enough quantity of notes. I mean, the one that I found really helpful is the Penguin Classics translation by Mark Muser and entering into the atmosphere of each canto and so all the different allusions, the figures he meets and so on, moving beyond the literal encounters to what is he trying to convey and open up in your own mind. Um, that can really help in a group because you talk about it and I noticed this, you know, what I want about that and and it, it helps make, you know, you have to venture a thought yourself. And so that helps make it your own. And I suppose it's important to read through the whole whole of the Divine Covenant. I suppose if you only read the Inferno, that's might not leave one in a place of, of hope, but, but despair. Or, or no, no, I, I mean, I would really encourage anyone reading it, particularly if they claim to be religious, you've got to read the Paradise. I mean, it, it's quite often remarked in our times you know that oh, I cut the inferno we get the inferno you know circles of hell and all that and kind of makes sense of our world sometimes people think well there's something in the power of purgatory you know people are changing and we believe in change but they say oh paradise you know don't really understand that I mean it says a huge amount to me that we live in a time that doesn't get paradise um, and um, it, it is it is tricky but it, it requires a different part of ourselves that we're not used to now um, in, you might say that in paradise there are no problems to solve, but there's still everything to discover. Um, and so it's about how we know and participate in life in, in ways other than just the scientific, you might say, if the scientific tends to approach life as a series of problems to solve or theories to prove. Um, the paradise takes you into a whole different way of knowing things. It's about participating. It's about resonating more and more with reality. Um, and seeing how um, a glaring light can become a subtle light that can open up new worlds, that the infinite is imminent and the transcendent is intimate and all these kind of things start to really make sense. And is the hope that the, the, on this inner journey, one would get to the paradise now or in the near future rather than simply as something for when one dies? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the Divine Comedy has convinced me that um, the main purpose of this life is to make us more capable of the next. And um, that um, it's by working on ourselves moment by moment, you know, like you can tune in more and more. It's like every moment offers a chance to step towards an expansion of life as opposed to a contraction of life. Um, again, you know, this is in many spiritual traditions. The Jesuits will talk about consolation as opposed to desolation and the examen that, um, that tries to consider which way you're turning moment by moment in life. Yeah, no. And, and of course, um, preparing for paradise is getting to know it now um, because you don't know about it in um, abstract or in prospect. You know about it because you start to share in it. Yeah. And you talked about Dante's midlife crisis. I was just wondering whether the Divine Comedy would resonate particularly with people. It's probably because I'm about to turn 40, but people at 
that stage? Or, I mean, what about younger readers, older readers? I mean, what, would they get something different from it or read it differently, do you think? Yeah, I, I've got a neighbour who's Italian and was raised in Italy. And of course, they read the Divine Comedy at school, much like we might read Shakespeare in England. And um, she said, oh, I can't stand the Divine Comedy. <laughs> Um, and I think there is a bit of a it's a bit of a shame when these texts hit you at the wrong moments, whether that's just to do with age. I don't know. But um, certainly they can hit you at the wrong moments. And if you're sort of force fed it, that can be soul destroying. But it, it I don't know. People have kind of crises in life at quite a few points, I guess, don't they? Um, but yeah. Dante does hook it on the midlife crisis. And. You know, Jung would say, Carl Jung would say that's because we tend to spend the first part of our life establishing our place in this world. And then we start to realise that that wasn't wholly satisfying or it didn't completely work. And so we start to ask the deep questions of life. Um, and so Dante's message very much is that what you do in this world is very much it matters for its own sake. But it's it matters for its own sake, mostly when it's preparing you for more life. Um, it you know life must be an open system um, uh, leading to more rather than just kind of folding and closing down on itself. Thank you. Um, I mean, perhaps finally, I mean, you you you're a prolific writer. What do you have? Have you got plans for for another book on any particular topic? Yeah, well, thanks there. Thank you. Um, I yeah, I've just actually submitted another manuscript which will be out next year, and that's on a related theme, um, but treated in a different way it's all, it's called spiritual intelligence in seven steps and i'm part of a project actually um organized by the international society for science and religion and also another body called perspectiva which is looking at spiritual intelligence particularly in contrast to artificial intelligence and broadly the idea there is that artificial intelligence is becoming more prominent in our life of course um i mean personally i don't think the real challenge is that Terminator 2 is about to come over the hill and kill us all as a computer wakes up, but um, that we will forget our intelligence is because artificial intelligence becomes so powerful. Um, and so spiritual intelligence, what is it? Can we articulate it? What's it to know it more fully? Um, and so my next book will be trying to give these sort of seven aspects of how we um, have this spiritual intelligence as well as other kinds of intelligence too um, and it you know turns on how we experience time how we experience death the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves how we experience freedom so a lot of key themes that are thought about today and spiritual intelligence brings a revelatory aspect to them thank you for listening to this week's episode of the church times podcast you can find more news analysis comment and book reviews on our website churchtimes.co.uk. If you are not yet a subscriber to the Church Times, you can try your first 10 issues for just £10. You'll get the paper delivered to your door every Friday, plus full access to our website and digital archive. Go to churchtimes.co.uk forward slash subscribe to find out more. The music for this podcast was provided by Sought After Sounds. Tune in next Friday for the next episode. Thank you.